What is up, guys? Jerry here with Sheepdog Ops, and I am your normal sultry voice every week. I know that we are missing Mike. Unfortunately, he's still pretending to be military uh, with his Reserve Guard annual duty he's got going on, and I know he's going to stab me back for that later. We'll worry about that next episode. Um, but today we have a great guest with us. Uh, it's actually someone I met through some of my social media contacts. I'm really excited about this and it's a different direction than we normally go. So I know we had hit a lot of, uh, police departments, military, uh, personnel and fire departments, but we really haven't talked about the other aspects of this whole first responder side. So Misty here is actually, and here it comes, he's going to do a little giggle. I promise. There it is. Um, is animal control, which is something that we don't normally think of when we talk about first responders because we don't think about them. We're thinking about accidents. We're thinking about gunfire. We're thinking about robberies. We're not thinking about a uh, homeboy ex complaining about a dog or a cat or something, some other animal, especially out where you're at, uh, out in the middle of the wilderness. Um, uh, so I I'm super excited about this. We've had this on the books for a little while, and so we have the chance to actually sit down and talk to her. Uh, Misty, if you want to give your chance to shoot a little intro and a little background about yourself, then <laughs> I'll send it over to you. Okay. Um, well, you heard my kid in the background. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm a mom of three. Um, I've worked at the police department for a few years now, um, and... I am doing animal control right now. Eventually, I will be going for patrol. Um, so I'm going to keep pursuing that. But right now, animal control is where it's at for me. And uh, so in, in yeah. case you guys are curious out right there, um, but how long have you been doing animal control? How long have you been attached to the police department? Uh, and what is your little bit of background that you have with them? Yep. So um, before I got into the police department, I worked at a call center for about 10 years and dealt with escalated people all the time, which created my love and passion of dealing with people. <laughs> I believe it. Um, but I started at the police department in 2016. Um, I actually did a Citizens Academy. Um, and the Citizens Academy... I know you're familiar with it. Some people aren't. Um, it's anywhere from four to six weeks, um, and they'll do it like two to three times a week um, in the evenings usually. And it's just something that educates the public, the citizens, on what their police department does, how it functions, you know, kind of some of the stuff that they deal with, um, why they respond and react in a certain manner. Um, and it just really helps build a better relationship with the community and uh, law enforcement. So that piqued my interest. I actually found it on Facebook one day. Um, <laughs> I filled it out. I was like, you know, because my life was Facebook before TikTok. <laughs> so um, I did that, and then that rose my interest even more. Um, and so I knew that there – I really got familiar with the lieutenant at the time, um, kind of just put my name out there, was asking about any openings, and um, he had mentioned that they were going to be hiring soon. So I did everything within my power to try to get hired on. Um, and I was going to apply for dispatch first because I had so much call center experience. Mm -hmm. And um, I did apply for dispatch because that position had came open, and I tested for it and I passed. Um, but there was three, there was two other candidates that passed and a couple of them outscored me. So they got I know hired that feeling. into this. Yeah. So they got hired into those positions and I was like, oh, okay. Well, I finally, um, I hadn't heard anything for a couple weeks. So I called them back and they're like, well, we got you on like kind of like a waiting list. She's like, but we do have a records position coming up. And I said, well, tell me about it. <laughs> so she told me about it and, um, I said, yeah, I said, if you actually do have that position opening up, I would love to fill that position. You know, I, I just want to get my foot in the door. Um, and then she's like, okay. She's like, well, I'll definitely keep you in mind. 
And about five days later, she called me and she's like, can you start on Monday? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, yes. Oh, hold on. I got to figure out childcare. <laughs> so, um, but I made it happen. And um, that's how I started my journey at the police department. Um, and I was in the records division and I did that for um, at least two years. I was in the records division. Um, and that is kind of a unique uh, department to be in. Mm -hmm. You deal with, um, like, you're like the front desk of the police department combined with doing all of records tasks. So when the public comes in and requests um, public records, uh, you know, we have to go through process that request. We have to redact all pertinent, you know, personal information that, one party can't have about another party. Um, you, you know, you have to follow all the, the guidelines and stuff that are put in the statute um, when it comes to releasing public record. And um, you not only deal with the public, you also deal with officers. Um, you deal with prosecutors. Oh, of course. So, uh, so you got a, you got a slew of things going on as far as uh, being a records official kind of because that's really what you're doing is you're officiating all the records that are in that system for the police department that you're working for um which is i know it doesn't sound like it when people talk about it but it's actually a huge deal because you don't realize how many people are actually reaching out for different kind of records how many people are reaching out to see where your background or what things that you had going on were um right behind the scenes so yeah, it's kind of crazy behind the scenes because, I mean, if you, just like any type of first responder um, position, records will ebb and flow just the same way. You know, mm -hmm. there will be times where you just get rushed and you get flooded with requests. And then there's times where it just kind of slows down. Um, and, you know, in the winter time is kind of what we call our off season um, because everybody's kind of hunkered down, especially here in North Idaho, you know, freaking Pacific Northwest. <laughs> It snows and everybody just hunkers down. <laughs> of course, why would you go outside? This is why I live somewhere where there's no snow. I don't believe in snow. I don't like snow. I like traveling to the snow and I like coming home where it's nice and warm. Where it's warm. Ish. Warm-ish. Ish. Warm-ish. <laughs> warm -ish. Well, I tell you what, I'm done with the snow. I'm over it. But um, <laughs> I live here now and it's kind of our off season. And then summer, you know, spring and summer comes out. The craziest come out because it's everything's thawed everybody's had cabin fever and then everybody just kind of lets loose and so spring summer just really pick up um and when that happens people get charged with stuff. Oh, well, all sorts <laughs> of stupid right. stuff yeah yeah and so then we get flooded with prosecutor requests because um, you know, they're coming in and they want officer body cameras. They want, you know, all, all those recordings. They want the dash cams. They want uh, all the reports. They want, they want everything. And it's a lot easier to process a uh, prosecutor request uh, when it comes to re actual reports because they can have everything completely unredacted um, okay. because it's, it's for court um, and it's for them to be able to, they, they are privy to all that information. Well, of course they need it for walking into court, being able to stand in front of a judge or in front of a prosecutor and say, Hey, this, this, and this X, Y, Z. That makes a lot yeah. of sense. Yeah. And so it's a lot easier because we get some folks that say, I want, and, and there's no real limit. Like after a certain amount, like after a hundred pages, they can be charged a certain, you know, a certain amount for like 10 cents per page or something like that after a hundred pages for public records. Um, and if it takes more than two hours to process the request, like there's a whole formula that we have to use if we're going to charge them. Um, but the prosecutor, we don't charge them. And sometimes those requests can take, depending on how much audio a case has. I mean, if it's a child abuse case, you're talking, this is months and months of Jeez. detectives working on these cases and just adding and piling. We had a child abuse case. I'm not going to go into too much detail, but we had one that we had to process and it was a six month period. Jeez. 
and I worked very, very closely with the detective on it. Um, and I knew exactly which audios went out because we would also have to keep track of everything. That's part of records. You, you have to track everything that goes in and out of that department, everything. So you are creating a footprint every single time you go into a case and you're documenting every single time, whatever you're doing. Um, and well, and, and, and I, the, the importance of this, because I want to I want to I want to touch on that just real quick um, for most people who maybe are military or following this channel or who may be civilian. Um, what you don't understand is that uh, chain of custody is extremely important on who touches it, who's been there, who's been around, because when you get to court, you have to explain each and every single one of these steps. Um, I know. Uh, we we go through a lot of people that we've interviewed on here, who especially are cops, and they don't really touch on the chain of custody issue. And this is kind of your expertise here because that's such an important part of a case once you bring it to court, once you get it in front of a judge, because if one little step is missed or one little step isn't uh, complied with correctly, you can lose a whole case. Yeah. All that evidence is thrown out. Yep. It's, it's extremely important the chain of custody, so when we check evidence out of the evidence bay, like when we have to, what the detectives do when they get um, audio uh, footage, uh, video footage, surveillance, anything like that from any type of crime scene, they have to check it in and book it into evidence. And in order for us to make copies of it, we have to check it out of evidence and then it's in our possession and it cannot leave our hands. And if it switches hands, then that has to be logged. And so on every single um, piece of evidence we have, there's a large label sticker that has the chain of custody. Mm -hmm. And you have to write in dates, who has it, where it went, um, initial and date again. And then when it switches back, like you just have to keep adding to that. Um, Cause like you said, a six, a six month case, uh, we've had like two year cases. If you miss one thing, the defense attorneys can turn it into this huge thing and the judge yeah. can throw it out. Oh yeah. Well, and this is, it's, what's funny is, is you look at cases, large cases, because obviously you, you, you've dealt with so many cases and I, I'm assuming majority of them are smaller cases. They're not going to be huge publicity, yeah. pu publicized cases, but you look at something large like uh, the O.J. Simpson case, and the biggest problem that they had was officers and the chain of custody that came along with that evidence that was with it. So this is the difference between what could convict somebody and something being thrown out because, well, somebody didn't initial or sign and date right. when they were supposed to. Yeah. And it, it, it doesn't seem like an important thing when you're talking to the average person, but when you're looking at it from the backside, it's a whole new ball game. Oh, it is. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I can't tell you how many um, hate mails is what I call them. <laughs> you know, those angry emails that come out. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> when someone's not following procedure and it affects a case, people get upset. Because think about how much time and energy goes into building a case. Because it doesn't just stop at the officer arresting an individual and charging them. Then once they arrest an individual and charge them, they write their report and it gets sent to the detectives. And at that point, the detectives go in and they do their investigating. And, you know, the charges then, if the detective thinks that um, a more of a case needs to be built, there needs to be more investigation, they're going to add charges to it, then that's where it starts to become in this huge case. So a lot of people think it just stops at the officer. It doesn't. Well, it doesn't. Sometimes it doesn't even start at the officer making an arrest. You, yeah. you think about something crazy like that is you put in so much time after the arrest is made to make sure you have the information that ends up in records and it's important that it's there and it's properly documented and everything like that. But then you have all that time before when they were building a case or they were creating this whole probable cause from the moment that started to the actual arrest, and then you get to where you still have to get evidence to convict. It's just, it's a, it's a long, strenuous process. And the hardest part of this whole thing is the documentation, is the actual, uh, 
process that's involved with records. Yeah. Which is, I know we're getting a little off basis here and, <laughs> and what we're trying to, to accomplish here, but I think that this is so important, especially if somebody wants to get into law enforcement and be involved with uh, the entire process that this is the stepping stone. These are, these are the important small, you know, just small pieces of it. Oh yeah. The, the tiny details. Um, and you know, there's a, there's a whole process and there's a whole filing system and everything And every records department at every agency probably does it a little different. Um, just because no agency is the same, mm -hmm. but every agency, you know, and, and there are state laws that are different and stuff, but like here in this, this law or this state, sorry, this state, um, the law is you have to maintain those records, all cases, um, minimum five years. Um, and that's, that's, that's most cases. There are certain, uh, caveats, um, depending on certain cases, like rape cases, 10 years, I believe. Um, some, some cases you have to hold onto the record no matter what. So it's, it's a statute of limitations, I'm assuming, is probably what involves with these ca different cases, right? Yeah, it is. Which... It is. And, uh, like, citations and stuff, minimum on the shelf for two years. Um, wow. After that, uh, and, and that's the hard copy. We're talking hard copies. Um, and this, this state actually just recognized, God, how long ago was that? Um, I want to say a year and a half. Uh, don't quote me on that. Hmm. Approximately a year and a half ago, um, the state finally recognized digital scans to be equal to a hard physical copy. copy. Wow. Yes. Really? Because uh, yeah, because up until that, and up until that happened, it was hard copy everything. It didn't matter if it was scanned into the system, which we have to scan everything anyway. That's how we log everything. Um, but we also had to keep the hard copy on the shelf. Well. Now, now we can scan certain things and just dis destroy the hard copy and just have the digital copy because now it is equal to. Okay. It used to not be. So we yeah, were. Well, I wish they had just destroyed my hard copy of that ticket I got in Idaho a couple <laughs> years back. So bitches. <laughs> so I actually had to do a project. Um, which was taking all the citations. We had like five plus years of citations. Um, and we were only really required to keep two years. So okay. I had to take, excuse me, all of those citations and scan each and every one of them, color code all of them, put them all in a system. Like this is just the tiny little details that records has to do. Because what happens is this person can be charged on this date, mm -hmm. but their court date it's six or eight months from now. So we have to have all that stuff filed neatly to where we can go get it if we need it because the prosecutor's gonna come in about six or eight months and say, we need this. Of course, and it makes your job easier when you can find it all easy at once, one time, say, oh yeah, no. This is how we find all that information without really having to double our work by looking for it. Yeah. Yeah. And you've got yeah. certain you've got certain folks that'll say, you know, they, they've been, you know, say for instance, they've been divorced for X amount of years. Um, and then they come in and all of a sudden they, they're in the middle of a child custody again. And so they want to, they want to go back 10 years on anything that happened at this address or with these individuals. And then you have to go back and you, you have to search all this stuff in order to process this request. Mm -hmm. So it's very time consuming. You have to be good with not only the public, but you have to be able to handle officers because a lot of officers, most officers, most good, most officers are type A personality. That's just oh, the of way course, that's that's the personality. That's what gets you good in that career field, or exactly. as a whole. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you have to be able to handle that, um, or else you're really not going to survive. <laughs> <laughs> which is which is crazy because you go from as we were talking about, you went from being in a call center. You went from a, where you had to deal with people who really, I, I'm going to be honest, I'm probably one of them, is just a complete jerk asshole to you because, well, they don't want some call center calling them, right. which was me earlier today, as a matter of fact. Um, 
but it, and then you get yourself in a position to where you're working with the public directly and working with these officers and you're kind of that go between at times where you're dealing with the officer who's processing and putting in the paperwork and then the public is trying to get that stuff from you because they're not going to get it from the officer directly. Yep. You're totally the middleman. Oh man. And you would be, I mean, you probably, you probably wouldn't be surprised, surprised, but most people would be surprised at how often you hear, well, the officer said. <laughs> no, I wouldn't be surprised, <laughs> but you're right. Most people would. Right. And it's like, no, 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 no. Uh, Okay, if the officer said that, I'm really sorry they misinformed you because you have to be that polite buffer. You're the face of the department, essentially. You're dealing with the public. And you're not, you're not someone that can charge them and you know, give them a wet floor. You <laughs> have to be polite and professional. And, that you sounds, are that just, just sounds so miserable. That sounds terrible. I wouldn't, yeah. I wouldn't want anything oh, yeah. to do with that. Yeah. See, I'm not built for that. This is why I don't deal with the public on a regular basis. Yeah. In that capacity. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> that was definitely, and, and it's kind of like living in a fishbowl. I mean, that's the best way to put it because mm -hmm. you're in the office. You don't leave the office. Like there's always somebody in reference. Yes. Um, and so we would always alternate our lunches. There was always someone there during the time, the hours that we were open. And so if one of us had to use the bathroom, the other one had to be there. Like <laughs> we just had to take turns. So. That leads to plus and minuses though, right? So obviously you have a set schedule of hours that you're, you're there as records because I can guarantee you our city has their records people there from certain hours to certain hours. I've seen it. I've actually tried to go in there and when it's time for them to clock out, they're out, they're gone. Yep. <laughs> so, yeah, but, no, oh, oh. gotta deal with it. I promise, guys. It's okay. It's all right. She's just being mom. That's okay. Just being mom with uh -huh. the bobblehead. Well, and that's 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 got to be the crazy part because you go from these set hours and this set schedule and this everything is structured extremely, extremely. That's that's exactly the way to put it. It's 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 structured extremely, and then you yeah. turn around. And we moved to where you are today, which is a couple of years down the road, obviously. And you're not in an office. You're not dealing with people in a capacity where you're not able to have some authority, apparently, uh, right. or, obviously. So, and yeah, that, so it's definitely different. Mm -hmm. So, how does how does that transition work? As far as, especially for you, how did that transition go from being stuck in a chair? obviously either looking at paper or looking at a T or at a computer screen all day long to now I get to be on the road. I'm out and about, I'm on patrol, uh, actually changing the entire structure of what you're doing. Yeah. So I, this position is more my element. Um, I worked in the call center for so long. I had my fair share of desk duty. Um, and so it was easy for me to transition from the call center to the front desk um, because I had already dealt with people for so long, escalated calls, things like that. Um, you know, I was a supervisor for a while, so I, I learned a lot on how to deal with certain personalities and certain people and, and, and how to talk people off the ledge, essentially. <laughs> so it was easy for me to work records for, for that aspect of it. Um, but I, I am a people person <laughs> and I am a very busy body, if you will. Like I have to be doing something. I, I just got to keep going. And so when I heard the position was going to be open for animal control, um, that was like, that's, that's what I want to do. That's what I want to do because I want to be able to get out there. I want to be able to handle situations. Um, I'm not afraid to put someone in their place <laughs> and that's like you big said, personality. Authority. <laughs> yeah. Big personality. Yeah. So you have to be able to have those things. And I was like, I can do this. <laughs> um, so it was, it was a lot of, it was more exciting of a transition. Um, and I think that's why it made it easy for me to transition is because it was something I really wanted to do. 
I worked with an animal rescue for a while before I got onto the police department. And so I kind of already love animals. Um, so that was a, a big, a big help too. Um, I mean, if you're going to be animal safety, animal control, then you're going to, you want to have some kind of passion for animals. Passion for animals. Yeah. <laughs> so a weird concept to have. Right. Totally weird concept. You need to like animals and have a passion for animals to be animal control. That's weird. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and it's funny because like people are, people want to know, well, like, what do you do? And anything that involves animals, really, anything that involves animals. And, you know, when you said earlier, um, when you said earlier about we don't really, when first responders, when we think about first responders, we don't really think about animal control. Mm -hmm. It's so true. But um, we get called in about vicious dogs. Um, and we're the, you know, if we're on duty, we're going. Yeah. And so we're put in that first responder dangerous category um, because we don't know what we're walking into. Um, if there is an animal abuse situation, and I have to take an animal. Now I'm dealing with not only this neglected animal that could potentially harm me because it's sick or injured or whatever, mm -hmm. but then you also have the owner. And you're not taking my dog. <laughs> and then it becomes a sticky situation if, uh, if they decide to, to argue or fight me on that. Um, so there are times where you know, we deal with people with a lot of alerts. Um, you know, if they've had past, uh, past experience with law enforcement where they've resisted or, you know, they've, they have offer, officer safety alerts. Um, sometimes we will have an officer go with us um, because we're not a sworn officer. Mm -hmm. And the only thing I carry is a taser and OC spray. So, and is that more for the dogs or for the owners? Well, either. Okay. <laughs> it's it's basically for my protection. So if I, um, the PD would rather me if I if I can and I have the ability to. Sorry, if I can and I have the ability to, just have an officer come out and respond. Um, so that way. You know, if the situation gets sticky, yeah. at least they're there. Well, it's but a lot easier if they're on scene than when you're waiting for someone to come on scene. Right. Mm -hmm. But if it's one of those situations where, um, you know, someone's rushing me, I have every right in the world to pull out my taser. So, and that's happened in the past. You know, um, my, my partner has dealt with stuff like that, to where she actually had an officer on scene and... Um, this, this group of people started to rush him and he took a step back and there was a swell and he like fell over as they were rushing him. And so she was uh, calling in for code backup and um, she had to pull out her taser. So things like that happen and people don't understand that or think about it because it's just animal control, you know? Well, of course, but, they don't realize that people get angry about their animals. They're, they're right. very passionate people. Even though if they're abusive or angry towards their animals, they're, they're still, they're passionate. And when yeah. a person gets passionate and you mix that with other elements, say some strange person coming up and saying, I'm going to take your, what could be their loved one in their, in their case, that could change the, uh, the psychological and mental capacity that they have right then. It does for sure. And I mean, I just have to say this. There, there are some people that love their dogs more than they love their kids. <laughs> you don't have to tell me twice. I know, I know people like that. And you know who you are. And, and I hope you watch this and know that I'm talking about you directly. <sighs> Sorry. Yeah. It's frustrating at times. It's neither here nor yeah. there, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, okay. I, I heard a joke the other day, and you're going to laugh at this. And it's kind of an animal safety joke, so it kind of goes with this. Mm -hmm. um, I, it, it was a meme, and it says, so apparently it's rude to ask someone that has their kid on a leash if they were from a rescue. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm going to ask everyone that, even if they don't have their kid on a leash. <laughs> and the other day, I, I can't remember where I was, but I was in uniform, and I couldn't do it because I was in uniform. Oh, I was at the park. They had this big event at the park. There was a lady with a kid on the leash, and I wanted to do it so bad. <laughs> but I was in uniform. All right, well, you know. I don't have to be in uniform, so I'm going to do that with every kid I see, whether they're on a leash or not. You know, that's just my, my saying. Now it's, it's going to become my new thing. Um, <laughs> so I, I, obviously kind of getting back to some of this story stuff that you're talking about, what is your biggest call out? Is it, is it mostly noise complaints and things like that where you're dealing with neighbors pissed off at their neighbors because their dog's barking their ass off and... <laughs> Yeah. So I, at times, like to call myself a glorified babysitter uh, for adults. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's really what it is. It, you're the referee, basically. You're the peacekeeper. You're the person that goes, you know, when, when someone can't adult and go and have a conversation with someone else, or they can't just resolve the issue on their, on their own, they, they call us. Oh, of course. Um, and so most of the calls that we deal with, animal noise. And that's probably one of the most irritating calls for me, because... Like I said, you know, I come, I was born in the 80s. I come from an era where you talk things out, you know, you you go and you handle your business. Um, oh, of course. But in this day and age, you just, it's it's unheard of now. It's not very common. Well, and I, I guess this kind of leads, I guess the question kind of goes well along with this, is I don't want to get too political, obviously. I try, I try to avoid political talk. <laughs> but obviously these... The, this new generation and this new generation of people who are own homeowners and kids who are starting to get up on their own is this lack of content contact with your neighbors. Because like me personally, I, I live in this neighborhood. I know a good chunk of my neighbors. They're all older neighbors. So we talk to each other from time to time. Every time we see each other out, we wave at each other, but I've lived in neighborhoods where I didn't know a single soul in the neighborhood and you didn't wave at each other, you didn't know each other, and does that, obviously, you're going to see the differences in neighborhoods. Does that oh, yeah. contribute a lot to where you're getting called to? Absolutely, 100%. That you can tell um, which neighborhoods are, are more old-fashioned, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, versus the, the newer era, um, because, and especially, like, a lot of the newer homes, um, you've got a lot of people moving over, um, a lot of younger folks buying homes, buying new homes, you know, first time home buyers and everything. Um, and what's happening is these people are all moving over. They're coming from different parts. They move into these houses, just expecting it to be, you know, quiet, like country life. And you're moving into a subdivision, a city, um, where there's noise, where there's going to be noise. Um, and they don't take the time to get to know one another. They don't take the time to introduce themselves, um, to build a relationship. And so when it comes to having any type of complaint or noise, it's automatically they're calling us. They're not even trying to handle it. And I can't tell you how many times I'll call somebody on the phone first, the person that wants to complain, I'll call them and I'll say, Okay, well, so tell me what's going on. And they'll tell me, you know, well, this dog it just won't stop barking. These people, they just put it outside and then they go to work and their dog's going nuts all day long. Okay. Do you know if the dog's actually being put outside? Well, it, it kind of barks for a while and then it gets quiet and then it barks more. Okay, so the dog probably has access to a doggy door. How do you <laughs> talk to your neighbors? Well, uh, uh, uh. And that's the response I get nine times out of 10. People just don't talk to one another anymore. They don't talk things out. And so then when I call the dog owner and I talk to the dog owner, they're like, I had no idea my dog was going crazy. I've got work all day. I had no clue. And so it's just a matter of letting the other person know. Uh, and see, and I, about I've been called. I've been called by neighbors. I lived in a neighborhood like that before I'm in, in my current address. I, I lived in a neighborhood like that where nobody talked to each other. You didn't know any of your neighbors. Like I knew my neighbors across the street, but that's because they were an older couple. They were a sweetheart couple that owned a, a dry cleaning place and stuff like that. But outside of that, we got a call and I had animal control show up at my house. I was at work. I didn't know. 
and they decided to that they were going to write me a ticket for noise complaint. And I was like, oh, yeah. when I got the ticket, I'm like, it wasn't my dogs. Like, well, that's who they called you on. I was like, but my dogs are kenneled inside all day when I'm gone. I don't, <laughs> I don't put them outside. So <laughs> there's no way that they were barking for 10 consecutive minutes, which I know the law. So it's, fortunately, I learned them when I dealt with this. <laughs> <laughs> but like you actually like it's weird because i'm assuming i don't know if it's the same in idaho i obviously i'm in california that an officer has to actually sit outside your home and listen for barking and it has to be for that time frame or else there's no noise complaint because it's not legitimate unless they have a recording obviously or something like that that proves that there's a time stamp so it's a real difficult case to process i'm and you obviously know this better than I do. Um. Yeah, um, yeah. here in Idaho, um, basically the citizens can sign citations against other citizens, and that's usually the, the route we go because we're really never there when it's happening. You know, we don't <laughs> live in that house. We don't live in that neighborhood. We don't hear it all the time. And so we tell the individual, you know, if you're willing to sign a citation and go to court over it, then I'll come by and have you sign a citation and I'll issue it on your behalf. But if you're not willing to sign a citation, the only thing I can do is call up these folks, have a conversation with them or go to their house, have a conversation with them and educate them on city ordinances. Um, so that's why animal noise is kind of, if I were to say the most annoying call, that would be the most annoying call. That sounds about nine times out of 10, you're going to get someone who is a chicken Sorry, but that's just the way it is. No, no, that was my neighbor. I, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> she was a dick. I mean... I didn't like her. When it comes down to it, they're already paddling, essentially. Yeah. You know, they're not handling their business. So, and then when they call you up, they want you to do everything. They want you to send a citation. And I, you know, I tell them, I said, no, I'm not there to witness it. I'm not sending a citation. I'm not going to sit outside their house for so many minutes to determine whether your complaint is valid or not. It's a waste of right. my time and the city's time. Exactly, yep. And so um, that would probably be the most annoying, but you know, we deal with everything when it comes with animals, you know, um, animal vicious. And that really is kind of a wide, it's, it's a loose term because a dog can be running down the street barking and maybe running in the direction of someone and someone call up and say, this dog is like trying to attack. And so we call it animal business. But the dog could just be barking because it's barking and it's a dog and it's happy about being free. <laughs> and it doesn't know you. It's, it's right. barking at you because it doesn't know you. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we deal with those. We deal with animal abuse. We deal with, um, yeah, and a lot of times the animal abuse is a dog in a car, a hot car. Um, and you get to break windows. No, I've never had to break a window, but I have removed a dog once out of the vehicle. Um, the vehicle was unlocked, and I got permission from my sergeant because the dog was looking lethargic, and uh, I needed to get it out of the car. Even though all the windows were down, it was just too hot um, in the car, and it was actually an old beat-up truck, but um, the dog didn't have access to water or anything, and so I had to get gain permission from my sergeant to remove the dog. I just broke the window just because at that point, even if the windows were <laughs> down, I'd have rolled it up just to break it. Just because it would have been cool. <laughs> just because it would have been fun. This is why I can't be animal control. It's determined right. now. <laughs> now I know why they didn't hire me. <laughs> so we deal with those. We deal with um, animal loose. It's just a dog running at large. Yeah. Um, uh, uh. We deal yeah. with those quite often. Can that um, be as simple as somebody parks. having their dog at the park off a leash? Yep, absolutely. Oh, goodness. So it's also, here's, take, listen to this. If a dog is on its own property, off leash, not contained, like in a backyard, if it's in the front yard and it's off leash and it can be called off of its property, it's considered at large. Wow. Yeah. You talk about, so you talk about semantics abuse. right there. Yeah. And I mean, I, that's, that one is hard for me. Like I don't, I won't, 
I won't sit there and patrol a neighborhood and look for dogs to try to call them out of their own property. I just won't do that. That's to me, that's silly. You should be able to have your dog, and if it's a good dog that sees in your yard for the most part, then that why sounds like dog? entrapment. Yeah. <laughs> so I just I don't do that. I mean, I if someone's having a, a severe problem with their neighbor and it's an ongoing issue and, and they're like crawling every week and it's documented here, here, and here, and here and the dog is actually an issue, then I'll educate and I'll let them know that they can sign a citation for the dog at large, even if it's on its own property, if it comes on one step, one foot off of its own property, it's at large. And so usually that only happens though, when there's actually like an issue and the dog owner just isn't doing anything to contain the dog. So, um that that one's like we don't have that happen very often but every once in a while we get the crappy dog owner you know that just lets their dog go and shit in everybody's yard <laughs> and then the neighbors get pissed about it deserves a citation if you ask me that's all i'm saying right? dog shitting in my yard and then i throw it at his window we've got other problems but that's neither here nor there oh He's drinking a bottle. <laughs> oh, okay. Not just, not just choking and choke over there. Good. Nope. I just want to make sure. I mean, a Heimlich <laughs> maneuver on the kid. Um, so I, I, this kind of, this is my favorite part of this section of the, the little outline that we did before um, is we get to get into some of the best stories that you've dealt with as far as dogs. I know that we've been going back and forth on one and everybody wants to hear it. So now it's finally the opportunity for the mass public to hear it. So I'm, I'm, I'm very excited about this because I actually, guys, I want you to know, I still haven't heard this story yet. This is a hundred percent real reaction and I'm excited about it. Very real. Go ahead, Misty. Very real. And are you ready for, um... not at all. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a dog. Oh, I've already had it my hopes. Cat. Okay. I've got jokes. I'm going to leave them alone. They're smart children present. <laughs> <laughs> and this cat, I'm not kidding you, was fucking psychotic. <laughs> <laughs> it was, I mean, if there was a schizophrenic cat that just wanted to murder, death, kill, it would have been this cat. <laughs> so <laughs> let me give you a little bit of background. So I was about seven months pregnant when I was on this call and um, I was still on duty, um, you know, still able to do patrol and everything. It may have been about six and a half months, but right around there. Um, and I get this call and we don't deal with cats. Our city ordinance, we don't have any ordinances here in our city regarding cats. Cats are free spirits. They're allowed to roam and do whatever the hell not, they want. Not even feral cats? doesn't matter. Oh my goodness. We have a terrible city. No I'm never moving there. Yeah. So, um, and you know, I've talked to, I've talked to the chief about it uh, many times and he said, ultimately it's just, it's too much to manage. You would need about 20 animal control officers, um, just to deal with cats alone. Like you would need a full on staff. Um, because in this area, there's a lot of feral cats. And so, um, with you being kind of more backwoodsy, is that important to the environment though? Because it keeps other pests and snakes and gophers and things away. So it's kind of it a does. plus and minus kind of thing. It's totally a plus and minus because you'll get some folks that just that are cat haters, which I get. Like I, I'm not a cat lover at all. You know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm animal control and I should love all animals and I'm sorry, but I just, I'm allergic to cats for one. So that's, that's negative points right there. And then for two, they're assholes. Cats are just <laughs> mean. I don't like cats. And so every once in a while you'll find a cool one, but for the most part, I don't. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of one of those good, bad situations because you'll get folks that take really good, like there's some really nice homes over here and they take such good care of like their yard and their homes and everything. And these feral cats come along and they mark everything and they
they put footprints all over everything and they dig up flower beds and all kinds of shit. So you get people that are just angry all the time about the cat situation. And you're like, well, I understand you can use a live animal trap, but you have to be humane. You cannot just go and like off the cat. Um, you know, you have to hold it for 24 hours. <laughs> like there's there, like we actually have requirements if they want to utilize one of our live animal traps because they could still get charged for um for animal abuse if they are actually doing something inhumane to the animal and so like you can't just trap an animal and then beat it to a pulp <laughs> i didn't say beat it to a pulp that never came out of my mouth no nope. <laughs> there's other things being thought but neither here nor there so anyway so with knowing that knowing we don't deal with cats and we actually, we just tell our citizens, you know, you know, here's some remedies that you can try to do to keep cats away. Um, you know, you can Google cat deterrence, stuff like that. Citrus oil is actually one of the best things. Cats don't like citrus. Um, and so there's just some natural cats remedies. Cats don't like BB can... guns either, just in case you guys are curious. That's I'm a just fact. saying. She they didn't say it. They don't like water hoses either. But uh, <laughs> I'm going to say it. They don't like BB guns. Especially when they're on a fence. <laughs> Carry on. So, <laughs> this lady calls me up. And she's like, she's like, my cat is attacking me and I don't know what to do. <laughs> you so owned a cat. The that's, the, that's the first problem. Yeah. I get her on the phone and I'm like, um, so what exactly would you like me to do? Because we don't, we don't deal with cats. We don't, we don't have an ordinance regarding cats. We don't, you know, we don't come and catch them. We don't take them away. We don't do anything with them. So it's your cat, your property, your responsibility. Why are you calling me? And, um, you know, of course saying that in the most polite professional way I could possibly say it. Which um, is that exact way, right? Cause. Probably, yeah. It probably <laughs> came across just like that. Um, <laughs> and she's like, she's like, well, I, I don't know. It's, just, it's, it's attacking me and I'm not letting it back in. And I'm afraid it's going to attack someone else. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm going to come over and I'm going to see if I can help you contain the cat. And she's like, well, she's like, okay, but what, the, what do I do with it if it's contained? That's your responsibility. It's your problem. You're going to have to figure it out. I don't know what to tell you. Again, she's like, not my job. Right. She's like, oh, no okay. job for it. She's like, if you could just help me get it, get it in a taxi or something. Okay. So I go over. I'm expecting just to be able to scoop the cat up and throw it in a taxi, right? No big deal. Seven Not months sure pregnant. Over exaggerating. What's that? <laughs> Seven months pregnant. You said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. I'm just. I'm painting the whole picture. I want to make sure the audience oh, yeah. really. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's, it's going to be very colorful. You, you just wait. So I get there. I'm on scene. I knock on the door. Um, this lady comes to the door, and she's got, like, straight up um, lacerations all over her arms. Like, this cat fucked her up hard. And she's got scratches everywhere. Um, she's some of them are still actively bleeding and she's like my cat's attacking me she's like it just had kittens and i'm like okay where are the kittens and she's like well they're they're in the house and i said was the cat in the house with the kittens and she's like yeah and everything was fine and then all of a sudden the cat just charged at me and kept coming at me and, and she's like and tore up my arms and everything and i was like huh she goes i'm letting you know right now if that cat comes to the door i'm slamming the door in your face and I said, okay, like, thinking to myself, really, is it this, like, wow. is it really that bad? And so I'm like, what exactly would you like me to do after we contain this animal? Because, like I said, you know, it's not really my, and then she's like, oh, here it comes. And she slams the door. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like I turn and I look and I see this cat and it's like this grayest gray like black striped cat coming at me and it's got like the the most eerie like jason walk happening <laughs> like if the cat could wear a mask it would <laughs> it had a machete and was wearing a mask exactly. this is that cat 
it was creeping up and it had it did like this groan like this evil like groan as if walking slow and then it gets about and luckily i had my gloves on i put my my leather gloves on before i got out of the truck um but it gets about three feet from me and lunges in the air at me That's and, a cat, if you ask me and I went to pull up my hand because it was going to attack me. And I went to pull up my hand and it, its nail caught the glove and it actually penetrated um, and it got my thumb. And I, <laughs> I lifted my leg and I kicked that cat. I straight up got attacked by a cat. <laughs> so it, it like fell back, hit the wall, and then ran off. And I was like, holy crap, like she was a lion. <laughs> this shit is serious. And so I go back to my truck because I didn't have anything with me. I only had my gloves. So I go back uh -huh. to my truck, I'm like, I'm going to need some stuff. And so I've got a taxi and I pull out the taxi. I'm like, because at this point, I'm involved. This cat <laughs> is a risk to the safety. The safety is a safety risk to the public. And I'm like, I got to do something. I got to contain this cat somehow. So the way it tried to attack me, it's going to attack a kid. <laughs> oh, of course. Oh, my goodness. That's a dead cat. Like, I said this is a dead cat. It should be a dead right. cat. Yeah. I'm like, and I thought about it, too, because I'm like, if I drive stun this cat with my taser, it might die, but it might also catch on fire. That could probably be bad. <laughs> I have a story point, about cats on fire, but I'm not going to tell it on here. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> At this point, I'm starting to get spectators. Like, <laughs> people are starting to kind of watch. And so I'm, I'm getting my taxi out. I'm I, There's a blanket in my truck. Um, but I didn't grab that until a little bit later. I had a net, and I grabbed the net. And I'm like, maybe I can just, like, scoop it into the net. Um, and then I had this little claw thing. It's, a, you know, it's like a – it has a claw on the end, and you you pinch it, and it's you can grab things with it. Like, I don't know, know what it's called. People with broken legs that are sitting in a bed all day long. Exactly. <laughs> Go on. Yeah, so I get that out because I'm like, well, if anything, you know, maybe I can just use that to either bash the cat on the head if I need to. <laughs> <laughs> this is getting violent or, quick, guys. Or, Be careful. This is going from PG-13 to R real fast. I'm going to end up with a bloody I'm cat. I'm not trained to handle vicious cats. <laughs> So I'm like, I'm going around, I'm like, all right. I did not have, um, I only had my leather cop gloves, which end right here. Like they're very short um, yeah. and they, they did not protect my arms at all. And I was in a short sleeve shirt. So I was a little bit nervous because I knew this cat was going to try again if I got close to it. So I went around the house where the cat was. Um, it's, I saw it in the bush. The lady opened the window. She's like, it's right here. It's right here. And I'm like, yeah, I can see it. I see where the cat is. I said, you said it had kittens, right? And she's like, yeah. And I said, it's probably trying to get back to its kittens. So she's like, I'm not letting it in my house. And I said, okay, can you put the kittens in a container so we can just bring the kittens out to the cat and maybe the cat will just go in with the kittens? You know, trying to think this through logically, right? Oh, of course. That's a terrible idea with cats. It's a horrible <laughs> idea. So, she doesn't just get, like, one or two kittens. She gets all of them. And we're talking, like, six kittens. Oh, and geez. they're probably, I want to say, about two weeks old. A uh, week and a half, two weeks old. She gets them in a little, con in, in a taxi, a separate taxi carrier. So, I go grab them from her real quick. And then I put the cat, I put them down about 10 feet from the cat. They start, excuse you. They start, <laughs> babies, what are you going to do, right? <laughs> Nothing. Um, I'm not going to do anything. We're just going to keep going on as if bobblehead isn't right there. <laughs> um, so about 10 feet away, the cats start meowing. They start doing their thing. I open the gate, so the little door, so that way the cat can just go in with the kittens. Mm-hmm. The cat hears them, starts approaching, and I took a step back, so that way I wasn't super close to it. Then the worst happens. These freaking kittens start doing what kittens do, and they start wandering. 
they start trying to come out of the taxi and I'm like, damn it. So instead of letting just a zoo happen, I go to pick up the taxi to keep the kittens in there. And this cat <laughs> lunges like from four feet away from me, starts lunging into the air. I kid you not, kittens and all. I body checked that cat with that taxi. Then air. <laughs> Freaking Simba over here. Simba's jump, pouncing to kill, and you're over here attacking it. <laughs> so, at that point, I'm like, Jesus. I'm like, okay, that's two. That's two times now the cat's trying to attack me. And um, so I'm like, all right, uh, that's not going to work. So I contained the kittens, and I put them, I just set them down. I went back to my truck. I'm like, I got to get a blanket. I got to get a blanket or a net or something. And I went over uh, to knock on the door, and I told the lady, I was going to tell the lady that, that's, uh, that you know, this didn't work, and I was going to put the kittens back inside, so that way, you know, they were just out of the way. Mm -hmm. Well, as I was um, talking to her, she slammed the door on my face again. <laughs> Second time. Prowler came back around. Oh, yeah. It started coming back around the corner, and luckily, I had dropped my net right next to the door. So I took a step back, and this cat is lunging midair at me. And I've never been so thankful in my life to freaking be have accurate aim at that point because <laughs> I slammed that net down so hard. I had the cat in the net midair and slammed it to the ground. And I'm like holding, I'm sitting on it, seven months pregnant <laughs> on this pole, this like, you know, 10 foot extender pole with this <laughs> net. This cat, I kid you not, is doing an alligator death roll inside the <laughs> net. Oh, yeah. Like, sounds, like, horrid. And before I did, I had used the net, we had a car pull up, and they were starting to get out of their car. And I'm like, no, 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 get back in your car. I don't want you to get attacked by a cat. And so they started laughing at me. I'm like, I'm serious. Get in your car. And so they got back in their car. And they were watching me the whole time. So when I had the cat trapped by the net, um, the guys like rolls down his window. He's like, "Hey, uh, um, do you need some help?" And I'm like, "Would you mind?" <laughs> and so he he gets out and he's like, "What do you want to do?" I'm like, "Just stand on that side of the net, like just on the edge of it, so that way the cat can't escape." Because it was bouncing that net around so hard that it was trying to get out from underneath it. So and then he grabbed a little extender and pinned the cat down. And at this time, I'm out of breath. Like, I'm getting <laughs> hardcore. Seven months pregnant, freaking wrestling a cat. Jason cat, mind you, people. Jason cat. <laughs> yeah. This cat's looking for death. <laughs> he was out to kill. So <laughs> at that point, I get on the radio, because I'm like, I, I couldn't do anything. I was on one end of the net. That guy was on the other end of the net. I needed help. And so I get on the radio and I'm like, you know, I say my call number and I'm like, I need to get it to my location. This cat's vicious. And I'm like panting hard. And they're like, get it to assist, blah, blah, blah. And so I had one of my officers come out and he had someone in SEO. Perfect. Perfect person <laughs> yeah. to deal with this cat. I don't, I don't care what anyone says. FTO. <laughs> if you're in FTO, you're dealing with the shit shows and this is one of them. Right. <laughs> So two officers showed up to assist me. So now we have three officers on scene. And um, he's like, uh, what's this? He thought I said vicious dog. And I'm like, this is a vicious cat. And he's like, it's a cat. And I'm like, it's a fucking cat. Yes, it's a cat. <laughs> and it has given me a run for my money. And so he's like, all right. So, okay. So he tries. He's like, well... He's like, can we just, and I'm like, you are not going to want to stick your hand. Like he had his gloves on. I'm like, I'm telling you right now that cat's going to tear you up. They'd already got through my glove. So he's like, well, how about we just help it relax a little so that way we can put it in the taxi. Cause he kept trying to grab it by the back of the neck and with the slippery gloves and the net, you just, his hands kept slipping and it wouldn't work. So he was trying to apply pressure to the cat's neck <laughs> in a more uh we'll say violent way <laughs> to make it sleepy so that way we could just put it in the container 
because we thought about dry setting it, like I said, but we thought it would burn the fat. So. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, if that's on body cam, I want to see it. I, I, just... <laughs> I don't know if his body cam was on or not, <laughs> but uh, he was utilizing the ground for one side of the pressure and his palm for the other side. And all you could hear, mind you, people are standing around watching and we've probably got about 10 people now we've created an audience and they're all watching this show go down and he's like essentially choking out this cat (laughs) (laughs) i got mma version versus a cat this is (laughs) this is too much i think (laughs) (laughs) i never thought in my life i would experience this but um I'm watching him, and he's like, I'm really not trying to hurt the cat, just so you know. I'm just trying to help it relax. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. <laughs> it go night-night. The cat go night-night right now. He's like, do you have a blanket? Because that wasn't working. He tried doing that for a good two minutes, and all you could hear was this, like, this cat's eyes were huge, and all you could hear was, like, the worst sound in the world. And so I'm like, yeah, let me go get my blanket. And he's like, get the blanket. We'll throw it over. Like, we'll kind of put it over the cat so that way the cat can't see what's going on. And then I grabbed my cat pole, uh, which is what we utilize for aggressive dogs most right. of the time. And um, we had to, to use it for an aggressive through. cat. Yeah. <laughs> like, the, it was the first time legit I ever used my cat pole. And it was on an aggressive cat. <laughs> I'm not kidding. So I we had to take that cat pole and slide it underneath the net and, like, it took a minute, but we were able to. I think we may have popped a tooth. Uh, but we, <laughs> this poor cat. But it was evil. So at that point, I didn't care. I was angry. I was angry at this cat. A win-win in my book. That's all I'm saying. I'm not the best <laughs> judge of this, though. So we finally got the cat's pull around the cat's neck, and I tightened it up. And um, now another oh, officer oh. comes on scene. Because there was another officer that was close to the area, and he wanted to check and make sure that I got assistance instead of radioing. He just figured he'd swing by. So now we have four officers on scene and a citizen helping. Uh, <laughs> so five people total. And um, we got the cat, and I got him on the cat's pole for her. I got her on the cat's pole. And so then they were they took off the net, and then the cat's like so wrapped up in the net like I'm trying to shake it out of the net but still have it on the catch pole and then it, <laughs> it breaks loose of the net and I have it on the catch pole but then it starts doing like this death roll thing while it's hanging itself because it refuses to go in the taxi we turn the taxi upright so we can just drop the cat in and it's doing like this roll thing and then spreading out to where it won't go in so like I'm holding it there I'm like this thing's an die in a minute you guys don't have a tranquilizer gun at this point i don't what are you, <laughs> unprepared I told my chief that's what we needed and he said yeah we used to have train guards that ended badly <laughs> <laughs> would have ended perfect for this one that's all i'm saying i know i know i know so finally after like 20 seconds of the cat hanging in the air like this doing this thing and me fighting with it i'm just like f it and I body slammed this cat with the catch pole into the taxi. Again. That, Mind you, this is this is round two of you slamming this cat <laughs> against or with something. Okay. Yes. <laughs> and so finally I was able to just slam it into the taxi. And then we, we closed the door and I was able to loosen the thing. And the cat was contained. I was like, oh my gosh. Finally, the cat's contained. Nobody's going to get hurt. I took the thing over and I knocked on the lady's door and I'm like, here's your cat. She's like, oh, can you keep it down? My landlord's over there. We're not supposed to have cats. Lady, take your cat. <laughs> like, straight up, take your cat. I don't care what you do with it. It's your property. It is a risk to public safety. You keep it contained. Damn. Yeah. And she so- says, we ain't allowed to even have cats. Yeah. She goes, well, she's like, well, what am I supposed to do with it? I said, figure it out. You best get a she cage. Still, <laughs> she still wanted me to take it away. I said, we are not taking it. No, you figure it out. It's your property. So then she was able to get the Humane Society to help her out. They sedated the cat and had basically had it with their kittens and decided to do uh, an evaluation, 10-day quarantine period, um, because the cat had bitten uh, the owner several times during the attacks and they wanted to make sure it didn't have rabies 
And then after that, I'm not exactly sure if the cat calmed down or if it was just psychotic and they put it down. I don't know what happened after the. You didn't do a follow up? Ah. Oh, no. Not so terrible. That. I didn't care at that point. <laughs> I don't blame you. I wouldn't have followed up on the cat anyway, unless knowing that it was it was no longer part of this earth, that evil, evil right? being apparently. I kind of was hoping that it would go to kitty heaven or other places <laughs> where evil cats should go. So yeah, that's my that's my one like straight up the best story that I have. Um, I fought a cat, and it took five people to contain this cat <laughs> i gotta i gotta admit it, it's well worth it so for everyone who was waiting and who's asked especially over the last like two or three weeks oh yeah well worth it this is this is this is worth it this is worth every minute of just listening even if you just listen to these last like 15 minutes of this it is worth every moment of it because I wasn't expecting that it to be a demon. Demon, actually, I expect all cats to be demons, but I wasn't expecting it to be that bad of a demon cat. Right. So. <laughs> I mean, I tell you what. When I was like animal safety, you know, when you think about some of the bad things that can happen, like especially like getting bit, there's a huge risk when you're dealing with animals, especially animals they don't know you. You don't mm -hmm. know their behavior. You don't know, like, their quirks. Um, you know, certain dogs can throw up a smile, and people can Those interpret scars. it. Are there scars? Those are scars from a dog. Like a boy. Yep. Yep. And it happens all the time. And so, like, that, there's so much risk yeah. in dealing with animals. But I can honestly say I never thought my worst call would be with a cat. <laughs> No, no, I wouldn't have ever thought that either. And I can tell you, I to this day, I have got, I have caught shit for it Jeez, because well. I had to have assistance to contain a cat. <laughs> well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna let you know it gave me great content. So if that makes you feel better, <laughs> I'm not gonna give you shit for it. I just think it's fucking hilarious. So. <laughs> All right, so as we wrap up, because that was, that was, I mean, to be honest, I was excited for that this whole time waiting for this podcast, and we've been trying to plan this out for, I, it's been almost three weeks, I swear, yeah. just trying to kind of time frame to do this. So I really appreciate you coming on, Misty, and sharing that story, and kind of actually, what's been great is um, hearing the difference between records, oops. I lost your video, but hearing the records between, or the difference between records and going into the next stages of uh, where you, not only where you are, but where you're heading, because obviously being in records, being able to deal with people on the front line, as far as paperwork goes, because that's the hardest part of anybody that I've talked to about being a police officer and going through that is report writing and keeping records straight and everything like that to going into where you're transitioning into the field and it may not be dealing with people as a whole but the people that deal with their animals and that's right. that's it's, it's an incredible story and I, i'm i'm positive going back to my mantra of this podcast everyone has a story and someone somewhere needs to hear it because they don't understand that there's a huge gap it's a difference between moving from piece to piece to piece and it's important every single piece of it and making sure the puzzle works the way it's supposed to, because if you don't have all of them, you get an ugly picture, which is missing half of it. So, right. exactly. I appreciate you coming on. I really, really do. Um, obviously, I got to get into my plugs for Battle Rattle here, because these guys support everything that we do, and they take care of everything we got going on. I know they've got some sales going on, some buy one, get ones, or buy two, get ones right now. So, guys, go check that out, battlerattle.com. Um, make sure you let them know that uh, Sheepdog Ops sent you or me, Jerry, personally sent you. Um, they'll hook you up. They always do. Every person that's let them know, they've got a few free trinkets going on, uh, whether it be something like this, which I was giving out on my page the other day or some pens, stuff like that. So these guys really hook it up and take care of us. Um, I know that we're going to make sure you get a shirt, Misty. Um, so we'll be talking after after we get done with this. And that way I can make sure I get what you want and send it out to you as quickly as possible. 
Uh, also, if you guys aren't part of the affiliate program, you can be. Just go to the Battle Rattles page, click the yellow tab, get affiliated with them. They're doing sponsorships for people who are gamers and doing Twitch, yada, yada, yada. I'm not into that scene, so I can't really speak too deeply on it. But um, we really appreciate Battle Rattle and what they've done for me and hooking this up and making sure that this can be a possibility. Uh, and then we get into my plugs for Sheepdog Ops. I am on Patreon. You can find it now on, uh, we do have a PayPal set up so that way I can send stuff to people when we do giveaways. Uh, it's at sheepdogmindset at Gmail. You get a hold of me there either for the PayPal account if you want to donate. And if you're just looking for someone to reach out to, um, I'm here. I answer that pretty regularly. Misty, you can kind of attest to that. Yeah. Uh, I, I try to make sure that I'm, I'm on that on a regular basis. It goes right to my personal phone. So I'm always hitting that stuff up. Uh, you can anchor FM. That's where our official subscription is. Uh, and then obviously you're going to be, re if you're watching this right now, you're seeing it on YouTube, uh, uh, the Instagram page everywhere. I'm trying to be everywhere all at once. So um, I think I've hit everyone and everything that I'm supposed to be thanking for everything. <laughs> Missy, I really appreciate you taking the time and coming on with us. Obviously, I'll be getting your information as soon as we get off. Um, and I, I hope you guys enjoyed this. It was, I, it's nice to have a different perspective. And I'm glad that you could come on and do that. Uh, is there any other final words that you want to give before we outro this? Um, be a responsible pet owner and talk to your freaking neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> the simple things, the little things, just be a human being again. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Um, and as we do every time and every week when we end this thing, guys, remember, don't be the sheep in the fight. Be the dog. <laughs> <laughs>